Well, hello and good evening and welcome to episode 19 of Fracking Nightmare. Now, if I look a little bit uh, jaded tonight, um, please forgive me. I hot-tailed it down the M6 and the M5 from Manchester, where this morning I was in the civil courts to hear the verdict of Judge Mark Pelling regarding the attempt to evict the Barton Moss Protection Community Camp from the verge on Barton Moss Lane. A camp that's been in situ since the latter part of uh, October of last year. So for nearly four months. And despite IGAS telling local residents that they only intend to be on the site for another 30 days or so, Peel Holdings, the landlord of IGAS and the owner of Barton Moss Road, initiated proceedings to evict the protection camp. So although those proceedings were initiated some uh, two weeks ago, the first hearing resulted in an adjournment and it was very clear that the uh, council for Peel Holdings expected it to be a mere formality, not expecting any serious resistance to the attempt to evict the protection community. So consequently, she was a little bit surprised when uh, the protection community, or a selection of the, but the people there, uh, appointed Lee Day solicitors and uh, the barrister, Lindsay Johnson, to represent them before the civil courts in Manchester. The first hearing resulted in an adjournment. During the course of the ensuing adjournment, uh, a number of people um, elected to um, contribute to the evidence of the case, to the witness statements, many people being from the Earlham and Caddishead area, confirming that they supported the camp in its opposition to IGAS. With a hearing, the hearing took place last Thursday and Friday. And uh, just let's have a, take a look at who the Barton Moss protection community were actually up against. What we see on the screen here is John Whitaker, the demagogue leader of Peel Holdings. In fact, he owns, or is estimated to own some 75% of Peel Holdings, the other 25% being held by a, um, a, a member of the Saudi royal family. His personal wealth rose to some £2.1 billion a couple of years ago when he sold the Trafford Centre. And um, he still retains offices in the Dome at the Trafford Centre. But Peel Holdings is perhaps one of the largest companies that people have never heard of. But if we were in any doubt as to who the Barton Moss community protection camp were up against, we need look no further than a report that was published a couple of years ago by Peter Kilfoy's company, Exurge. And if I just uh, bring up a couple of uh, excerpts from this report. It says, in a devastating conclusion on Peel's corporate mentality, this report lists the following traits. An indifference to public opinion, and a tokenistic approach to public consultation and due democratic process. Contempt for local government. A preparedness to enter into potentially lucrative sectors, regardless of experience. A cavalier attitude to soft, non-commercial concerns, such as public and environmental health. It continues... A similarly cavalier approach to local need and preference, a readiness to exploit legal loopholes, a dogged determination in the face of opposition to win, and perhaps most significant here, corporate combativeness. Peel is prepared to fight its corner in the highest courts. A preparedness to abandon sinking ship projects if and when these prove to be unprofitable. 
So it shouldn't really be any great surprise to find Peel Holdings very much in bed with iGas because some of those traits can equally be labeled with iGas. Let's just go back and take a look at the list again. And in difference to public opinion, it's very, very clear that iGas have absolutely zero social license to operate in Barton Moss, to drill a well there. The number of people, local people, coming down to oppose iGas's uh, convoy of deliveries every day is increasing. A, a fact acknowledged by the uh, police liaison officers there. Contempt for local government, we see that. The statements and the planning applications that iGas put forward back in 2010 bear little or no relationship to their intention to drill through the five and a half thousand feet thick layer of shale down to uh, the limestone bedrock at ten and a half thousand feet. So consequently we see a symbiotic relationship here and it's no real surprise to find that the iGas licenses across the northwest of England follow the, Ma the Mersey and the Manchester Ship Canal, land ostensibly owned by Peel Holdings. Now, I don't believe for one minute that Peel actually really wanted to get involved in the dispute between the protection community and iGas. But having fallen so far behind schedule as a result of the uh, walks in front of the convoys and the lock-ons, and I have to say that many of the lock-ons are directly attributable to aggressive policing. When the policing is relatively benign and the escort of the convoys takes something in the region of an hour to hour and a half, then everything is calm. But of course then the TAU, thugs are us, are unleashed upon the Barton Moss protection community, and they push for a record. And Friday week ago, I think they achieved that record, a walk down of Barton Moss Lane in something like 11 minutes. Well, that victory proved to be somewhat hollow because this past week, from a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, there were significant lock-ons which delayed the convoys, on average, something in the region of about two hours. So this is the game. This is the game between, if you like, the uh, Greater Manchester Police and the Barton Moss Protection Community. Primarily, of course, though, the purpose is to raise awareness, to gain the publicity, so that the wider community start to take a look at why it is that the Barton Moss Protection Community is prepared to camp out on the edges of Greater Manchester through the winter months and to persistently and consistently work to delay iGas's progress at the Barton Moss well site. Well, that is, that is actually reaping significant reward, as we'll see uh, in um, a few minutes. But more and more local people are making the effort to come down to join the protection community in escorting the convoy along Barton Moss Lane. Well, this obviously was somewhat disturbing to iGas, and iGas really couldn't do very much, seeing as they had no jurisdiction whatsoever over the land upon which the Barton Moss P Community Protection Camp were actually occupying. So they obviously had words with Peel, and we have no idea who was um, pro uh, underwriting the, uh, the legal challenge, probably a shared effort between iGas and uh, Peel, although at this particular moment, yours truly is actually um, potentially subjected to a significant uh, part of those costs. Anyway, as of Thursday, the case opened, and for a day and a half, the iGas, uh, sorry, Peel Holdings at Council, effectively tried to obfuscate over the ownership of The Verge. The Peel Holdings cartographers produced map after map after map, all purporting to demonstrate that Peel Holdings held sway over this particular piece of land. However, Judge Mark Pelling made it very, very clear that um, he was very concerned and he wanted to see 
the absolute proof that Peel Holdings had not leased this piece of land to the farmer who effectively had uh, the lease on the adjoining field. And when Peel claimed that the farmer's lease stopped right at the edge of where he grew crops, the judge expressed his surprise, stating this was very unusual, seeing as a farmer rarely ploughed or cultivated right up to the very edge of his holding. Normally there was a verge leading up to a fence. Well, Peel continued to dispute this, and right up until the final stages of the hearing, Peel maintained that uh, all the maps that they produced proved that they actually held sway over the verge. However, the judge wasn't convinced. And in the final moments of the case, a plan that Peel had clearly been hoping that uh, uh, their opponents, in this case us, the Barton Moss Protection Community didn't find, came to light. And in this plan, the smallest scale plan in the bundle, it clearly showed that the leaseholding of the farmer went right up to the edge of the road. And I have to say, at that point, and the judge, hearing the judge mumble something along the lines of uh, that he would have to take a judgment on whether or not that was the case, we left the court cautiously optimistic that Peel had failed to prove unequivocally that they held sway over that particular verge. And the judge had been very balanced, very measured through the two days of the hearing, clearly demonstrating that he had read through the evidence, as of course he is expected to do, and was familiar with uh, the detail of the case. Roll the clock forward to earlier this morning. And right from the moment the judge walked through the door, something seemed to be not right. The body language of the judge was very, very different from his body language on the two days of the hearing last week. His delivery was very different. He was halting. He was stuttering. He seemed agitated even a little aggressive. And when he was delivering the, the verdict, he seemed a little uncomfortable. The verdict, of course, was that the Barton Moss Community Protection Camp should be evicted from the verge on Barton Moss Road forthwith. The Barton Moss Protection Community Barrister, uh, uh, Lindsay Johnson, who did uh, an outstanding job in representing the camp, immediately asked for the right to appeal. On a number of issues, the judge denied Lindsay's request to appeal, but Lindsay persisted and managed to get the judge to agree that Lindsay could make um, an appeal to the, uh, the Royal Courts in London. That appeal was submitted a few hours ago and will be considered by a judge tomorrow morning. Depending on the decision of that particular judge will determine whether or not the Barton Moss Community Protection Camp is indeed evicted at noon tomorrow. This, in my opinion, is a complete travesty. And based upon the demeanour and the behaviour of the judge this morning, compared to his demeanour and behaviour on Thursday and Friday last week, one has to seriously question whether or not the judge received a visit or perhaps a phone call over the course of the weekend and was advised or perhaps reminded of the facts of life. Over the past few months, many, many people have made the observation that uh, challenging Peel Holdings would be an impossible task. Peel Holdings clearly believe that they hold absolute corporatist sway in the northwest of England. This may be the largest company that nobody's ever heard of, but it's about time that people did. This kind of corporatocracy revels in operating beneath the radar. It revels in achieving its goals, its obnoxious goals, riding roughshod over everyone 
that gets in its way, whether that be within the local authority, within other businesses, or the private individuals. It's time for the people to understand that this country is being assorted by a corporatocracy. In many cases, a globalist corporatocracy. But even within our own shoreline, we have companies that literally will stop at nothing to achieve their goals. Those comments I made earlier are part or are taken from a much more detailed report about Peel Holdings activities as they sought to gain corporatist control of the Liverpool area. So my counsel to people is it is time to understand what you're up against. Ultimately, these corporations require people to be in absolute ignorance. They require their absolute apathy towards their modus operandi so that they can effectively get away with blue murder. And as we've seen today, of course, the message that has been sent, although Judge was very generous, he actually reduced the um, award of costs to just 95%, saving, uh, shaving off 5% on the basis that some of the submissions made by uh, the camp barrister had indeed um, been accepted. But 95% of a very large number is still a very large number. And as things stand right now, yours truly and uh, the other named defendant stand to bear those costs. And of course, the message is, don't mess with us. We are the corporate gods. And what we say goes. And anybody who dares stand in our way, we will ruin. We will destroy. We will ensure that you are in no position to mount any challenge on our corporatocracy. I guess, of course, are very much in bed with Peel, and it should be no surprise that the chief operating officer of IGAS, a uh, guy by the name of John Blamires, was in court for the entire first day of the hearing. Obviously, IGAS and Peel are very much of the opinion that if the camp is evicted, then it will mean that the protest will effectively be over. Well, boys, have we got news for you. Because just as when the police force through the convoys in 11 minutes and there is a reaction, you can absolutely be assured that there will indeed be a reaction to the eviction of the camp. Already, we have received messages from people all over Manchester and further afield committing themselves to be at Barton Moss not just tomorrow for the, for the time of the eviction, if the Court of Appeal don't um, uh, extend the, the stay of execution, but every day. So after four months of the camp being in situ, it's going to be very interesting to see how IGAS managed to function over the next 30 or so days when the camp is moved from the verge but the ire of the people of Manchester is raised by this outrageous display of rampant corporatocracy. We'll take a short break. Sixty percent of the English countryside is under threat from fracking, a process which has transformed the landscape in many parts of the United States and Australia and contaminated the drinking water and air with highly toxic chemicals and gases. One in three hydraulic fracturing was using a carcinogen. So it really is a chemical cocktail that goes into the earth, of which up to 40% remains there. The grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and everything that was in the water was burnt. The MDs have been instructed not to report any negative health effects that they believe to be associated with living over a gas field. There's nothing inherent about the shale gas process that is going to lead to problems. 
Some of this material was actually taken to a large sewage treatment works, which had no capacity to handle radioactive materials of this kind. 800,000 gallons was dumped into the Manchester Ship Canal. 50 seismic events were recorded during just six fracking treatments. What is the minimum depth that the fracking will fracture? We can't tell you until we drill the excavation. Have you no was. idea whatsoever? Because it doesn't look like you've done your research. Shell gas is all the we make it happen. We are just numbers and we are sat on this rich vein of gas and they will do and say anything to get that gas out of the ground. And welcome back to part two of episode 19 of Fracking Nightmare. And of course, a very special welcome to those from Peel Holdings, I guess, and the Greater Manchester Police who have uh, tuned in primarily to see if you get a mention. Well, you're definitely going to get a mention tonight. But of course, um, I'm actually on the program here only speaking for myself. Or am I? I'm joined tonight by uh, Tina Louise from... Um, Blackpool, I think about it there for a second. Um, <laughs> Tina Louise from, from Blackpool. Tina, can you hear me? I very rarely stay in one place, so yeah, Blackpool mostly, mostly. But then because you and I turn up at all the same events, then yeah, it's hard to remember where we're from really sometimes. <laughs> well, ain't that the truth. So uh, yeah. I don't know, where, were you actually uh, tuned in when I was um, just giving the introduction and explanation about events of the last few days? Yeah, I caught most of it. We were having a residence action on filed fracking meeting tonight. We have those once a fortnight, so I was involved in that until um, nine. Shot through here to do this, and then uh, so now I've caught bits of it. But I've also been trying to keep up on Facebook and social media to try and see what was going on today because trying to keep up with the events. It was all happening so fast. Um, so yeah, it, it's. Uh, I understand about tomorrow. We're all going down there tomorrow. Well, there's three of us going down in a van to be as much use as we can be in a van. I know Bob Dennis from trying to find someone with a large vehicle to hopefully help anyone who does need to leave the site or wants to be somewhere else. I also read somewhere about um, how many um, bailiffs are going down. Someone said 200, but again, things get inflated, but I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read enough about it. Well, I think that uh, that information actually comes from the PLOs, um, who are not necessarily the best informed. I, I mean, they are simply a channel of information. So it, it may well be um, a, a bit of an intimidatory um, measure. But of course, uh, this is what we're up against and this is what they're up against. So if we can go to the screen here a second. Um, this is a, a picture that I posted a couple of weeks ago. Um, so here we have Sure Group. It's going to be very interesting to see who it is that um, Peel Holdings actually engage to try to enforce the removal of the camp. Um, and of course our own investor removal team and uh, I think that the investor removal team is um, is actually planning on increasing its range of activities and of course increasing its presence in other locations is that your understanding Tina? Absolutely. I mean, to me, this is just a stupid act on their part. By moving us from one roadway, do they honestly think that it's going to have an effect on stopping the anti-fracking movement? The anti-fracking movement has been growing steadily and continuously. You cannot stop something once it has this exponential growth that we have. You know, all we needed as an anti-fracking movement, and you and I know this because we've been in it for a long time, is all we needed was the time and the space to get the truth to reach as many people in our country as possible. Because the second anyone hears the truth about the facts of fracking, they instantly become anti-fracking. The only reason they're not anti-fracking people, you know, that not everyone is, is they haven't heard the truth yet. They've been subjected to one of the most powerful and well-funded PR and marketing campaigns, not only on behalf of the energy companies, but on behalf of our government too, which is railroading this in. So yeah, I, I think that uh, they, they would be foolish to think they could do better. Uh, actually, I, I mean, in, in many respects, I, I mean, obviously we uh, were anticipating that this move 
uh, would come at some juncture. In fact, I think to some extent we were a little bit surprised that it took so long uh, to, you know, to be presented. And, and that's, that's the reason I think that Peel Holdings were trying to sort of stay out of the equation. Because, you know, for a company that um, uh, likes to operate beneath the radar, primarily because of its uh, dubious uh, activities, um, then obviously uh, what this has done now, it's actually served to act as a catalyst amongst the burgeoning anti-fracking movement. Uh, because, you know, when something like this occurs, you know, people's ire is stirred and, uh, you know, their, their anger needs to, uh, to manifest into something. And so that actually is then um, transposed into help of the camp. And, you know, the level of help, I, I had to leave. I finally pulled myself away from the camp at about two o'clock this afternoon, uh, just so I could stay within the speed limits of the M6 and M5 to get down to the southwest. West. But, you know, the number of people coming to the camp and, and I left just before the walk out of the convoy and apparently it was amongst the biggest walkout ever, which speaks volumes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Also, I think, you know, they, they what they don't realise is that when you just get off, just stopping people sleeping the night doesn't make an ounce of difference. If anything, I'm really hoping this galvanises local community because I was counting it in my head today when we found out about the eviction. I thought, you know what? I can already count a full line of people, enough people to slow those trucks coming in and going out just based on the local population that is represented almost every day there as it is. So I don't see why this will change anything because people can still get up and be on that site in time for the nine o'clock truck arrival and stay there and see them back out again. There's nothing to stop them doing that. One person can stand and slow a truck. One person can stand and be the ob the block in front of that line. OK, you're not going to be that effective as one. But that's all it takes. It just takes people just to get down there. And if it comes from within the local population, all the better. All the better. Oh, well, you most know, definitely. You know, and not only, but I mean, people like us, and we can only get across there maybe twice a week, but we will continue to do that. And also, the people who will have to leave camp because they don't live in the area, well, there are other places now that will receive them. So you've got other camps need to be set up. So hopefully this will help us disperse some of our most experienced protectors throughout the country. So this is useful in that sense, too, because there are a lot of areas in need of protectors and in need of galvanizing their own local communities you know we did um, a, a meeting last week over at Inskip where the Rosica site is uh, the one that's just recently been announced by Quadrilla and we've done public meetings for years like you have and this was a real turning point for me you know I looked around the audience and normally we get an audience apart from anything else it was standing room only and when I'd asked the parish councillor do you expect many and he'd set up like 50 seats he said no not really no one ever comes to these things <laughs> and then all of a sudden we were full and they were filling out into the, into the streets and into the overflow room and but talking to them, it was that to first introduce the subject like we have done for a while, where first of all, you have to introduce the, the, the ugliness and the risks involved. And that's a horrible thing to do to a lovely community that maybe has never heard of this before. But this wasn't like that at all. These people had educated themselves. They'd already been out there and looked. All they wanted us for wasn't to tell them what fracking was. They understood that. All they wanted from us, where do we go from here? What resources can you provide? What's our best method of approach? And can we form a group? And so basically these people are already formed. And, and this is, you can see how that's progressed because you think in the beginning it was a totally different world. Whereas now you know that every community that sees that drill rig as destined for them knows instantly that a protection camp is an option, the public meetings, the objections, and that all those, all those tools are available to them to help fight this. And yeah, this is a tiny island, you know. It's not like the states where everything was spread out. It got in under the radar because it was being done in the prairies or something and no one really noticed until suddenly the water went bad. Here, we've got the benefit of hindsight, their hindsight. So we can really rush with this. But, but I am cautious. I think the public is very much getting behind the anti-fracking movement. And yesterday was so telling on that. 
But we, I don't think we should ever forget how big this industry is, how mean this industry is, and how damn determined they are not to lose their investment. And they need to plow through with this. And that's quite scary, really, when you think about it. Well, I think that um, we have seen very clearly over the weekend uh, exactly how politicised this issue is. You know, when I left the courtroom on Friday, like I said, I was cautiously optimistic because in my biased opinion, the Peel legal team had singularly failed to prove that um, Peel Holdings had jurisdiction over the verge where the camp is situated. In fact, quite the opposite. It was really quite apparent that they were trying to conceal the fact that the farmer's lease actually extended up to probably about a metre from the tarmac. By the way, that's a lease that expires on August 31st this year, coincidentally roughly around about the time that IGAS anticipate returning. And of course, when IGAS do return in September, it will be with the intention of conducting a flow test, which of course they cannot do without actually fracking. And so we, we potentially have another six months or so to continue to raise awareness and uh, to ensure that by September, any company, whether it's iGas or anybody else, who thinks they are going to be able to run a flow test, who thinks they're going to be able to frack in this country, has another thing coming. Because by that time, it will be a lot more than escorting trucks into a well site. Yeah, an exploratory well is one thing, but an intention to frack is effectively an intention to conduct chemical warfare against the people yeah. of this country. And of course, it's going to be up to the people of this country to do what they would be expected to do in the event of the country being attacked from outside. But this is an attack by our own government who are concealing the facts as best they can. I mean, we know there's effectively a national media blackout on all things Barton Moss. And I literally have, you know, very little hesitation in asking the question as to whether or not Judge Mark Pelling you know, received a phone call, an instruction, a reminder of which side he was expected to bat on. You know, this agenda is so politicised that uh, the normal course of justice is unlikely to be allowed to uh, to flow without some kind of, um, how should I say, uh, manipulation. Yes. I think today one of the things I wrote on my um, protest, um, I wasn't wearing, carrying a banner. That's so hard to carry around. So I, I got, got a sheet and we, we wrote our messages all over that so much easier than carrying a banner and also I carried the names of lots of people who wished they could be at the event yesterday but couldn't make it either their carers or the disabled or can't afford it or it's just too far to come um, but one of the messages I wrote was um, something that Vanessa Vine once said which was at what point do you call this self-defense I said this is not a protest it's self-defense and that's what this is this is communities standing up to defend themselves because their government won't defend them and that's an awful situation to be in and with regard to the media coverage again you remember at Balkan we made the media there all the time and suddenly up here in the desolate north no one's coming no one's covering this it's like yesterday we were covered by pretty well by RT so Russian television comes out and calls it the biggest anti-fracking demonstration the UK has seen and the BBC covers it with a blip Nothing much, you know, hardly anything. Oh, they did. Uh, actually, the BBC did describe the uh, events yesterday as relatively peaceful. I mean, yeah. Let's let's of course not forget that um, the BBC's Manchester offices and studios are actually rented from Peel Holdings. Oh, that's true. Media City. Yeah. So, you know, a little bias there. But, I mean, let's just have a look at a couple of photographs, or a few photographs, actually, so that people can see what we're talking about in terms of the event. This is the anti-fracking rally, which started at noon in Piccadilly Gardens in the centre of Manchester. And uh, my conservative estimate is that there was at least a 1,000 people there. I mean, the... 
uh, even the uh, the police told me they thought it was somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred. Of course, the BBC said there were twenty three. And, ah. <laughs> uh, you know, and. and ah. the, um, but I mean, I mean, it was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, it was yeah. just an absolute. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful day, which of course uh, you know, brought the Very brought the people out. Place. No, Very in little. fact, there was it was actually I think apart from the three or four uh, police liaison officers. Um, I, the only other police we saw was when the march actually went past the uh, headquarters of Thugs R Us, the TAU, and, and there was a little bit of banter exchange there. But, I mean, there were some incredible banners. I mean, this, of course, is one banner that uh, actually got my attention. <laughs> Fracking nightmare coming to your town. Um, <laughs> by the way, somebody has deposited a, a, a beautiful piece of art on a rock. Um, on my caravan at uh, Barton Moss with uh, Fracking Nightmare uh, right across it. So, I mean, this was a wonderful, wonderful day. Um, primarily, the people were from the northwest of England. And it's very clear that uh, communities are gearing up. Uh, whilst this was going on, um, one of the uh, local residents uh, in the Earlham area actually took a trip over to Farndon in Cheshire where there is a rig uh, that's already uh, drilling an exploratory well into the, uh, the coal seams um, on the borders of uh, England and Wales. I think it's just on the English side of the border. It's between uh, Chester and Wrexham, say in the village of Farndon. And uh, there were some 60 odd local people gathered at the, the gate. And uh, basically the conversation went around forming a camp. And of course, the issue is that local people don't camp. I mean, given the choice between going home to a warm yeah. bed and having a shower or you know, being in a tent, even though the, we're now getting into spring and the weather's improving, but nonetheless, people still opt for the, uh, the warm bed. So invariably, obviously, it does need people to come in from outside. And I think a number of people will go from Barton Moss to Farndon. I know some will go to, to Nottingham. But hopefully, as we get into the um, warmer temperatures of spring and the summer, and as the awareness increases uh, right across the country, then we, we are going to see this fastest growing environmental movement in the UK expand, as you say, Tina, exponentially. We have yeah. uh, an enormous uh, challenge um, ahead of us. Tina, we're going to take a, sh a short break in a second. Please, please stay with me. Stay online. I've got a few other things I want to um, discuss with you. But uh, meanwhile, uh, as with all things, to maintain a constant presence, to keep traveling around the country, to meet with communities does unfortunately still cost. And um, right now, with the uh, sword of financial Damocles hanging over my head, thanks to uh, standing up to Peel Holdings, then I need a little bit of help. And I know that there's a lot of people out there who would be right with us at Barton Moss in Farndon or in Nottingham or wherever. The need is to challenge these corporatists who have every intention of getting their bits in the ground and fracking beneath your community. But a number of us are doing this on a full-time basis. We're up against people who are absolutely determined. They're working on it 24-7. They have some of the best PR liars in the UK working on their behalf. If you feel you can support us, please go to frackingnightmare.com. And over on the left-hand side of the page there, please help us by making either a one-off donation or a monthly contribution. Every little helps, but we have a battle royal ahead of us. We have 15 months until the next general election, and in that 15 months, we have to achieve an absolute outright ban on this abomination in the UK. We'll take a short break. Join me for part three in a couple of minutes. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk 
or call 01626 337 531 to order your copy now. And welcome back to part three of episode 19 of Fracking Nightmare. Now, last week, episode 18, we were talking with Brian Monk, a farmer from southern Queensland whose life and livelihood has effectively been destroyed by the gas industry. Now, Brian, unfortunately, broke down during the course of that conversation, just as he did when he joined us on episode two. And the trigger for his emotion was the impact that the gas industry has had on his grandchildren, not least the significant impact on the health of his four-year-old grandson. The evidence that this industry contaminates water, soil and air wherever it is unleashed around the planet is absolutely irrefutable. And yet we are dealing with an industry that is undoubtedly about to start using the Ukrainian crisis, which has been deliberately contrived, but we'll be talking more about that on a, uh, a Humanity versus Insanity report in a couple of weeks. The global corporatists are determined to unleash global conflict. It is their standard modus operandi at times of global economic meltdown. And this isn't gonna be any different. But they're also going to use it to try to browbeat the British people into accepting an abomination that will effectively destroy this nation's water supply. You know, regardless of the impact on gas, I can live without gas, you can live without gas, but neither of us can live without water. Tina Louise. Hello. Oh, well, <laughs> thought you'd gone there for a second. <laughs> Here is one of the uh, placards from Sunday that uh, caught my eye. We will reap the chemicals they sow. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, um, earlier this evening, I was doing um, a Humanity versus Insanity uh, program where I was uh, speaking to a guy who has done a lot of research into geoengineering and the impact that geoengineering is having on our water and our soil and our air. But uh, what is occurring through geoengineering is going to be accelerated dramatically if the fracking agenda kicks off. Now, on the File Peninsula, you've got a lot of agricultural land. Yeah, and we're Lancashire cheese, we're cabbages. You know, um, we recently just set up, uh, this only happened in the last two weeks, a new group here. And they're not a geographical group, they're a business group. Their remit is to what they set themselves as a task, as the Northwest Business Task Force, is to challenge a group that was set up by Quadrilla and Centrica called the Northwest Energy Task Force which has taken some of our business people from the area and said, we are pro shale, we think it's good for Lancashire. So now um, the flip side group is set up and I was meeting with them the other night and they are looking into the promises of jobs, the promises of the uh, that they're making to the economy and so on. And they're looking into the job losses that will come in agriculture, the job losses that will come in tourism. And they're also looking at the, rather than looking at the things that we as humans are looking at, they're looking at the things that business looks at, which I think is another important level to be dealing with this fight on as well. So they're going to look at that sort of thing. And agriculture is one of the biggest parts. In fact, amongst the group is one of the biggest agricultural um, growers in the area. So we're hoping that that group will have some impetus and be able to, you know, pledge the case of these people who are going to suffer as a result. Because you think about it, you know, one spill, just one spill, and it could damage a farmer's reputation forever. And so, you know, and then not just the, the farmer's reputation, but you get that into our water course, that gets into our groundwater, that gets into where our crops are growing, gets into where our dairy herds are feeding. You know, what happens to that? Well, once it's in the chain, we are a tiny island, everything's connected. Well, we are we're, uh, potentially uh, the last generation that is uh, at least gonna have a bit of a choice 
Um, I mean, you know, it's not, yeah. much, not much of a choice today, but at least we do have a choice. I mean, we can still go and buy organic food. We can even grow it if we have the opportunity and the inclination to do so. But uh, if this industry does kick off within a generation, that that choice is going to disappear. And in fact, the reality is that this country will become dependent on the likes of Monsanto and Cargill and uh, the genetically modified produce, um, which has probably been already genetically modified to be able to grow in uh, alkaline soils and um, uh, methane-rich um, air. I think what's terrifying when you think about this is that if, you just said, if this takes off, and you know, when, when you said that, I thought, good grief, if it does take off, and if they do get fracking through, the implication of that is that our government, all, all sense of democracy falls at that point. Because essentially we're saying, the government is saying, I do not care whether you live or die. That is the least important thing to me compared to the desire for profit from industry the industry itself and the shareholders in that. They are essentially saying to the UK population, you do not matter. In the scheme of things, you do not matter. You are just part of a risk assessment and you came up as too little consequence when it comes to the profit of this industry. And I think that if this takes off in this country, I know with certainty I leave the country. And maybe I can make that happen. Not everyone in the country can make that happen. You know, I, I'm, I'm willing to, you know, go anywhere just to get away from this stuff because I wouldn't raise my grandchild in a country that has fracking. I just wouldn't. So I can't personally allow this to happen. So <laughs> I really like it here in Lancashire. Um, but I think the implications of that are quite terrifying. And, you know, that's another thing that comes to people when you have these meetings like the one we had at Inskip. Uh, we got a letter afterwards uh, from a couple very much kind of like the people of Balkan. You know, these people have retired here, voted all their lives, read the right papers, believed what they were told. And they wrote and said, we feel like we've been fools. We've just been fools. We went to the Quadrilla meeting. We believed what they told us. We didn't expect to learn a single thing when we came to you. And when they came to our meeting, they walked away within five minutes. They were already convinced. It doesn't take much truth to know it's truth you know it's very recognizable you could be soft coated by some pr and, and all the stuff quadrilla and i guess do to you at a meeting but it's only when you walk into an anti-fracking group and you listen to the raw truth that you recognize it instantly and are familiar with it well and this is the pattern isn't it i mean this is the, the pattern you're right across the country whether it's quadrilla whether it's eye gas whether it's dark energy whether it's celtic it doesn't matter who it is obviously the company that intends to frack in that community gets in first because they know where it is that they're targeting and, and then they put forward their sanitized presentations and uh, of course that's exactly what we we're up against in Earlham and Caddishead in the uh, um, communities around Barton Moss and it was only when the uh, camp became established and people were curious and started going going down there uh, and then I and Helen and a few others uh, managed to find a way to get into the uh, some of the iGas community meetings and people's jaws were dropping as we were asking the questions that iGas didn't want asked and and now we know that the iGas community liaison group um, they put minutes out because it's a box ticking exercise for them. They simply have to report that they held a community liaison group meeting. Uh -huh. The fact that these meetings are becoming increasingly hostile towards iGas is, is not reported. And of course, this is a direct result on the fact that people are becoming educated. They're doing their own research. They're coming to their own realization. And of course, what really frustrates them is the realization that they have been lied to with such an order of magnitude. You know, you, you may recall um, uh, back last year, I spoke to Anne-Marie Wilkinson, who's the director of communications with um, iGas. And she told me that, yes, we watch uh, your uh, fracking nightmare, Ian, and you put out nothing but lies. 
and, and I invited her to um, come on the program and uh, share with the audience uh, all the lies that I put out. And I said, you know, you can expose me as the liar that you claim I am. Break the lies down one by one, you know, and it'll be live, no editing. And then she said, uh, uh, no, 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 uh, but I will write to you and I'll, I'll write all the lies that you put out. You know what? I've never heard back from her because they know, they know very well that we hold all the moral high ground because they know that once we stimulate people's curiosity and we direct them to such things as the list of the harmed or uh, discussions with Brian Monk or Gasland or Split Estate or Truth Behind the Dash for Gas and just encourage them to look at this information for themselves, there's no going back. Oh, Tina. Oh, the call has dropped. So, well, Tina, hopefully will be back with us uh, very shortly. Meanwhile, the British um, Geological Society actually uh, has a website which looks at the seismic activity around the UK on a rolling basis. And uh, if we actually, if you go to the website, you go to uh, just Google British uh, Geological Society earthquakes, you'll find it. And if we look there, then New Ollerton in Nottinghamshire seems to be the epicentre for a significant amount of seismic activity. Now, of course, this is right in the heart of the East Midlands coal seams, which Dart Energy and iGas, and amongst others, are planning to exploit. Now, of course, they claim they're going to simply tap into the coal bed methane, but um, to do that, they have to go through a process known as dewaterfication. And one of the ways in which dewaterfication of the coal seams is accelerated is through fracking. So here we've got a clear indication that this is a uh, seismically active area of the country and the unconventional gas industry without any regard whatsoever is intending on going there and making it even more unstable. Now, something that uh, caught my eye just before we started the broadcast tonight, and the reason I actually went to the uh, British Geological Society's um, website is because the Daily Mail has uh, published online um, an, a statement that uh, earthquakes have occurred in Manchester. In fact, I think I can probably bring that up on the uh, on the screen. I will eventually. And um, that doesn't want to come up apparently. Anyway, it says that Manchester was shaken by another small earthquake today, the British Geological Survey said. So maybe the website lags behind uh, real time. A tremor measuring 2.9 on the Richter scale was felt in areas of North Manchester at 4.39 a.m. An aftershock measuring 2 on the scale was felt 14 minutes later and then followed a series of three more small aftershocks. The latest tremor comes after Greater Manchester was hit by a series of quakes yesterday, which caused damage to property, but caused no injuries. The first tremor, measuring 3.2 on the Richter scale, alarmed people arriving for work at 8.45 a.m. There were reports of a smaller tremor seconds later. A second earthquake, measuring 3.9 on the Richter scale, 11 times bigger than the morning's tremor, shook the area at 12.42 p.m. Just seconds later, it was followed by an earthquake measuring 3.4 on the Richter scale. Further quakes followed at 6 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. The fire brigade reported damage to several homes in the district, including falling chimney pots and slight damage to stores in Manchester city centre. The British Geological Survey said the earthquakes were quite big for the UK, but only minor damage would be caused. Now, interestingly, these earthquakes are larger than the um, seismic events that uh, occurred on the Fylde Peninsula as a direct result of Quadrilla's fracking operation there in 2011. Now, the well at Barton Moss has not been fracked. But we do know that iGas 
have experienced some difficulties. In fact, they've uh, gone through rather more drill bits than I think they would uh, uh, care to have used, which is another reason why they're running so uh, significantly behind schedule. So this is Manchester. Uh, we can't obviously um, confirm, prove that uh, this seismic activity is in any way linked to iGAS's activity on Barton Moss, but um, I think we can probably uh, be fairly safe in the assumption that if this industry gets underway, for an island that has geology that is so heavily faulted, we can expect a lot more of this kind of event. Meanwhile, in um, Oklahoma, there has been a significant um, increase in, in activity, earthquake activity. Here we go to the screen here. This is a 5.7, which is um, uh, many times greater than the earthquakes in uh, Manchester. And this has been directly attributed to the disposal of used frac fluid, of wastewater. And uh, as an alternative to the evaporation pits, which are an absolute abomination, fortunately they are banned in Europe, they have been pumping the used frac fluid down disused wells. But of course the frac fluid is still live, it's still doing what it was designed to do, which is create artificial porosity and permeability in the geology, and it is causing instability in the geology. So we in uh, the UK still have no idea what the industry is going to do with the used frac fluid, with the wastewater, with the flow back. And neither do they, because at the moment they are claiming that they are simply going to store it in double skinned tanks. Meanwhile, we monitor what iGAS are doing. And um, I, amongst others, regularly walk around the iGAS site. We have some interesting photographs of some pretty serious uh, discoloured water uh, leaching from their site. And of course, any time we are walking around the camp, then we are monitored. Here we see one of the um, iGAS uh, security guards with his CCTV camera live streaming back to uh, headquarters somewhere. Well, we're simply taking photographs and looking at at the contamination or potential contamination from the iGAS site there. Um, well, this came, Tina Louise, are you back with me? I am back, yeah, I've been, okay. my well, little buttons kept appearing, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well you're back with us, we've just got a couple of minutes before the end of the show, but um, this caught my eye today, it was posted uh, on the uh, Fracking Nightmare Facebook page, and by the way, if you are on Facebook, uh, do come along to the uh, Fracking Nightmare page, it's a rapidly expanding community, along with many of the other anti-fracking pages on Facebook. It's a, a little bit of an incestuous network, but the important thing is that it goes beyond the incestuous network and we share it with the wider community. But this was a spoof um, of the Daily Fail. Um, I wonder who that is a spoof of. Anyway, uh, but the, the uh, spoof article here is set some 10 years in the future. And the headline there, fracking ensures we now need to rely on imported water for drinking. And the headline, Britain now out of water. So tragically, Tina Louise, um, I think that is uh, actually not just prophetic. Um, if this industry does get uh, established, that is going to be the reality. Absolutely. And, you know, the only thing that's that's going to make a change is people talking about this stuff. There's a new campaign launching. I expect you may be hearing about it, too, on the 19th of March. It's called entitled We Need to Talk About Fracking. And it's an attempt to get a nationwide engagement in this conversation and it's being launched by a whole heap of um you know obes mbes lords uh, people uh, academics celebrities all sorts of people have signed up to this and that has a really big impact at other levels of society as well you know we're, we've got to hit it at all levels we've got to get everybody engaged in this conversation because this is a conversation the point I'm losing you. I've lost you, Tina. But we need to talk about fracking, a new campaign launching later this month. 
It is imperative that we talk about fracking. It's imperative that we sow the seeds with friends and neighbours and work colleagues and that we encourage them to do their own research. If they don't, then this could well be the view from their back window anytime soon. This is the Castle of Oz, as described by a young five-year-old boy who lives with his family on the moss. And last week I read out a part of the letter that his mother wrote, where she started to look at this abomination of an industry when she was asked by her five-year-old son, Mummy, will the drilling in the Castle of Oz crack the earth and if it cracks the earth will we all die well we have to do whatever it takes to avoid condemning future generations to lives of unimaginable abject misery join me next week on fracking nightmare thank you good night